Using an innovative new approach that incorporates various branches of research, including neuroscience, mathematics, genetics, epigenetics, and computer science, the uh, Ludmer World Class Center offers a unique multidisciplinary platform for the study of mental illness. The center brings together top researchers, some of whom we'll be hearing from later today, from the Neurological Institute, the MNI, the Douglas Mental Health University Institute, and the Jewish General Hospital's Lady Davis Institute for Medical Research, all seeking to break new ground in how we understand devastating mental illnesses like depression, schizophrenia, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and others. So a little later in this evening, we'll be listening to a conversation with Ludmer Center researcher Kieran O'Donnell, whose work in the field of epigenetics is opening up exciting new avenues for the prevention and treatment of many of these conditions. But before that, it's my pleasure to introduce the person who really has made this all possible. And without further ado, you can guess who that is. It's our friend, McGill graduate, Irving Ludner. Irving. So you might be wondering, what am I doing here? Because I don't do any research. But anyway, so I gave them a few bucks, and they put the name Ludmer on, and that's the story. But I think I'll, before I leave, I'll just like to elaborate a little bit about the people who comprise the research. And so I'll tell you how I got involved with this thing. Um, it was a kind of holdup of kind of sorts, but not, not too bad. What happened was that I studied physics at McGill, and um, when I observed what was going on in the universe, and we talk about matter defeating antimatter, and there's still some antimatter around. And then we look at the um, astrophysics and see what goes on in the, in the universe. And it's really, really, truly fascinating. So we have energy fields like gravitation and electromagnetism, and the Higgs field now with CERN uh, at Switzerland uh, finding the Higgs boson. and. Um, and all of these wonderful things, of which matter comprises 10% of the universe at max, and then you have dark matter and dark energy and all these kind of things which keeps the universe expanding, and people talk about the multiverse if you're a string theorist. And, um, and so you look at all of this, and it's fascinating, but none of it talks about consciousness. And so I was really interested in what makes matter with energy or matter itself turn into consciousness in animals and even when you look at photosynthesis, vegetables and so on. And what you should really do is join with myself and this fellow Dr. Evans and we should bring a new approach to the solution of mental illness and I really need the neuroinformatics thing at the Montreal Neurological Institute while Michael was a researcher at the Douglas Institute. And you know, the thing is that because of the stigma that we all encounter when we talk about mental health, the funding for mental health research is way, way beneath. You mentioned cancer, everybody's there. And if you mention all the studies that have gone on with heart disease and so on, and the backing that gets. But now I think the tide is turning. We start to see some support, and my interest in this was it was as close as I was going to get to considering what is uh, consciousness. You're fantastic, Irving. Thank you. Uh, uh, your generosity, your vision, your perseverance. Um, it's a lesson for us all. Uh, these things don't just come about by chance. It takes a lot of hard work. I know you put that into it on, on everybody's part. And um, look what we're left with, this wonderful institute that I'm sure will make a significant contribution to the battle against mental illness. Dr. Uh, O'Donnell is an assistant professor in epigenetics and epidemiology in McGill's Department of Psychiatry 
psychiatry, excuse me, and a principal investigator at the Ludmer Center. He works in close collaboration with Dr. Meany to examine how early adversity can become biologically embedded and the implications this has for a child's mental health right into adult adulthood. His subject tonight is Where Nature Meets Nurture, the New Science of Preventive Mental Health. And here to moderate uh, Dr. O'Donnell's presentation, we're pleased to have yet another McGill graduate, Anthony Robart, McGill graduate, as I said, who many of you will recognize because you do all watch Global News as the anchor of the evening news. Evening news? 11. 11 p.m.? Half the audience is asleep by then. I'm, I'm asleep. <laughs> Couple of years, Anthony's going to graduate for us to eight, <laughs> seven. I see. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we'd see more of you if you went back in the morning. But <laughs> congratulations to you. So, without further ado, and having not insulted you, Anthony, but teased you, <laughs> I'll ask you to come forward and do your do your uh, whatever you do as a moderator <laughs> with Dr. O'Donnell. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm still wondering what I do, so it's, <laughs> it's, if it's any consolation. Thank you. To fall off the stage, that'd be a bad start. Uh, <laughs> so obviously there are, are so many things to talk about. It's such a fascinating conversation. And as Chancellor Meehan quite appropriately described, it, it's really a battle against mental illness, isn't it? And thankfully, all is not quiet on the Western Front as the, the study and the, the focus and the there's so much effort going into it, and of course you are on the front lines of this, mm -hmm. of this battle. Um, and there's so many things to talk about, but let me just start in terms of your involvement in the Ludmer Center, and just give some background a little bit sure. of how you got involved in it, first of all. Sure. So um, I joined the Ludmer Center around five years ago, actually. So I was doing my PhD in uh, Imperial College in London, and I remember going to Boston for one of the largest conferences on child development the Society for Research into Child Development. And up on the stage was none other than the Michael Meany. And uh, he was giving a presentation on the effects of maternal care in the rat on developmental outcomes on the offspring. And these outcomes were the timing of sexual maturation, anxiety-like and depressive-like behavior. And it really just clicked for me. I was like, that's the guy I need to do my postdoc with. Um, so I moved from London to Montreal and I spent the last five years working um, with Michael and in that team and then of course with the generous donation from Mr Ludmer, the Ludmer Centre started a couple of years ago and really we've seen the, the beginnings of a very exciting phase of research at McGill um, and now I'm very uh, delighted to be part of the Ludmer Centre going forward as, as, a, as a PI, as an assistant professor. But what is so incredible is that we are just, just scratching the surface over into a field that Frankly, we don't know how big it will ultimately become. The scale of the problem can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Ludmer, you mentioned just a few of the staggering um, numbers. Like when we think about it, the human genome, three billion base pairs. If you were to stretch it out, it's two meters end to end. That's packaged into each and every cell. And then that DNA can be looped, which is beautifully complex, but a nightmare to study. Yeah. Um, and then it can, be mod it can be modified at various different sites. We know that people can have variation at millions of those sites in the genome. Right. And that's in each and every cell of the 86 billion neurons that are with within the brain. And then you go from that level of understanding up to something like depression or schizophrenia or inattention and hyperactivity disorder. And you think, how can I go from an understanding at a molecular level to understanding those ind individuals that are going to be at risk for an adverse mental health outcome? and ultimately how can we do anything to treat them. And speaking of, when you're talking about uh, at risk, this doesn't start necessarily, I mean it could start later in life, mm. but you would argue that it starts much earlier than that. Um, 
as, you know, for an unborn child, for example. Exactly. So a lot of my research has been focused on one of the earliest periods, which is that of the in utero period, so the prenatal period. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly interested in how variations in maternal symptoms of anxiety or depression or prenatal stress can influence the development of the fetal brain and how that can set that child up for a developmental trajectory towards an adverse mental health outcome. And there's really growing evidence from a number of cohorts across the world now that have been collected longitudinally, um, including the cohort that I worked with um, when I was doing my PhD, where we had 15,000 pregnancies, and we, we followed those kids from pregnancy until uh, now they're in their mid-20s. And what we've seen is a persisting influence of the early environment on their symptoms of mental health problems. So how do we... How do we address this earlier on? I mean, we, we throw around terms like genetics and epigenetics. First of all, for, for those who don't understand, the study of epigenetics has, has been going on for quite some time. Yeah. But the true understanding of it, of course, we're just j getting into it. But in terms of, uh, the, I don't know if this is the proper term for it, but the alteration, perhaps, or the modification mm -hmm. of the DNA makeup, explain that, first of all, for and sure. how that can play a role. Well, from a historical perspective, we know that epigenetics plays a hugely important role in giving a cell its identity. So if we think about it, there's over 200 different cell types in the human body. And when you go from a stem cell that can become any cell in your body mm -hmm. all the way down to a fully differentiated neuron, there's massive changes in um, epigenetics. And epigenetics just literally means on top of genetics. And people have likened it to grammar or punctuation in a novel. Um, the genotype or the genome gives you the instructions, but the punctuation or the grammar tells you how much it should be expressed or how little it should be expressed and when that should occur. And we knew for a long time that that was important for giving a cell its identity. But really, the, the, the revision to our understanding of epigenetics came from studies from Michael's lab and others, but particularly the study looking at maternal care and influencing DNA methylation of a gene called the glucocorticoid receptor. And that's very important in terms of regulating st the stress response. And what they were able to show, and that was really the, the new piece of information that really showed the environment could influence um, DNA methylation, mm -hmm. was that the level of maternal care that a rat experienced in its first postnatal week of life had a profound influence on um, both the developmental outcomes, but also the methylation of that particular gene. And my colleagues have gone on to study a wide range of genes now, and it's not just the glucocorticoid receptor. Really, there's pervasive effects of maternal care on the molecular regulation of the genome. And I think it's with that understanding that we're gaining from animal models that there's hope that we can translate that into clinical studies. And that's what I'm trying to do. So on, on that note, what is restriction uh, when it comes to, because this is the study when it comes to rats. Mm -hmm. um, what is the restriction, if any, when it comes to humans to determine this and to really uh, explore this on a deeper level? Yeah, it's, it's really challenging to uh, try and translate these findings from a, from a mm. preclinical model where you can control everything. You can control how much light they see, what their diet right. is, the strain of the animal, so you know that the genotype is kept constant. Um, and then you move to humans who will maybe not fill out their questionnaires or maybe won't fill them out truth truthfully for you. Right. Um, so you really kind of have to consider all of these other variables that you don't necessarily have in the animal work. But really, if we're going to make progress to actually translate those findings so they will be of clinical relevance, we have to try. And that's what's exciting about the Ludmer Center is, Mr. Ludmer mentioned there's multiple different cohorts that we're working with from across the, across the globe, really, right. to try and get at this, to try and translate those findings. Now, forgive me if, if a lot of you uh, already know the background in terms of the, the study when it comes to the rats, but mm -hmm. give some little more background over what was, what was found, because I think this is pretty fascinating yeah. when you talk about how you took certain rats away from their mothers and switched them, and you came to the conclusion that what? I mean, effectively, the mothers the, it came down to for lack of a better description, licking their pups. Yep, so, so in the lab we spend far too much time looking at rats. Yeah, Just okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but if and, you and rats licking other rats. Yeah, yeah. so it's, <laughs> it's been a great five years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Th but, thank uh, you, Mr. <laughs> but uh, if you take 100 rats right. um, so, and you breed them and they give birth to their offspring, it's really quite remarkable that there is this natural variation in maternal care 
So um, approximately 30% will show high levels of maternal care. Mm -hmm. And we, when we talk about maternal care, there's a repertoire of behaviors that the rat exhibits towards its offspring. Right. But one that we find is particularly um, predictive in terms of the outcomes that we're interested in is this licking and grooming. So where um, the, uh, the pups are nursing, but then the lick is, uh, the dam is uh, giving them tactile stimulation, so licking them mm -hmm. at the same time. And uh, we compared those individuals that are exposed to high levels of maternal care, so the top 30%, and those um, exposed to low levels of maternal care, so the bottom 30%. And if we compare them on anxiety-like or depressive-like behaviour when they're adults, we can see marked differences. We can see marked differences in their stress response, and we can see marked differences in the obesity of those rats. And the only difference, really, that they've experienced has been the level of maternal care in the postnatal period mm -hmm. because they're taken away from that mother at 21 days and then they live um, either pair housed or um, in threes and they have no further manipulation up until adulthood. Right. Um, so really that gives us an idea to look at more causal associ associations. I think this is where you, were, you mentioned the idea of cross fostering. Mm -hmm. So if we can um, use a kind of an animal adoption study um, where we take some pups from a low licking uh, mother and we um, uh, pass them over to a high uh, care dam, can we alter the phenotype? And indeed that we have been able to show that, that you can alter the phenotype of those offspring depending on the uh, mother that they've been raised by. And effectively you can extrapolate that, that the effect would be very similar, if not the same, when it comes to humans and, 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 and you know, human babies, for example. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's really, it's tricky, <laughs> it's, okay. um, but we're involved in a study that I am very excited about, um, which is a longitudinal trial because obviously it's completely unethical to take one child from one mother and course. give it to another mother <laughs> scientifically as much as you'd like to do it. Um, <laughs> um, we might edit that out. <laughs> and, uh, but what we can do is we can impose an intervention and one of the studies that um, is ongoing in the Ludmer Centre is a follow-up of a 25-year um, longitudinal study mm -hmm. of a parenting intervention where we go into women that are at high risk of abusing their children mm -hmm. and it's trained nurses who visit them from pregnancy until two years of age. And there's been quite remarkable treatment effects in terms of that intervention. Um, it has reduced child maltreatment and child neglect. And I think what got most pu public policy people interested was that it reduced um, criminal behaviour and antisocial behaviour by 50% right. at age 15. Now we've gone back and we've collected blood samples from those children born to the women that experienced this intervention and we've characterised DNA methylation, their genome. And now the question is, can we identify if there's a signature on the epigenome that's predictive of their own current mental health or reflective of the intervention and the abuse that they may or may not have suffered earlier in life. When you speak of that, when you have uh, effectively their life, you know, charted out, mm -hmm. you know, if someone has uh, experiences trauma, their their parents experience trauma, and therefore it's passed on to their children, um, whether it be me mental illness, uh, which can then be translated later in life, mm -hmm. can this be reversed? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to have this effect and the, the alteration, if that's the appropriate word, mm -hmm. on the DNA, and effectively these genes are, are lit up, mm -hmm. and, uh, can this be changed? That's a, it's a brilliant question, um, and it's what we're trying to get at. Um, I think the thing that I'd like to, to, to point out, especially with regard to my own research on maternal prenatal anxiety and prenatal depression, most children are not affected. But what's interesting is that those children that are affected can be affected in different ways. Now the question is, can we then harness that information to identify what makes certain children resilient to the effects of early adversity? Mm -hmm. And is there a way that we can develop some kind of target from that knowledge that would allow us to do just that? Um, and that's the, they're the kind of questions that we're trying to answer with this research. Um, and trying to incorporate information about genetic variation that may moderate the effects of early adversity on mental health outcomes. Um, and also potentially looking at how that influences the regulation of that gene in terms of the um, variation in DNA methylation or the epigenome. So when you mentioned the word public policy, uh, those two words very important because if you look at, uh, I, I might go back in mm -hmm. terms of the studies in a moment, but when you look at the, the effect on, on every family, I mean, frankly, I don't know anyone who doesn't work incredibly hard mm -hmm. and the effect on, on the family life 
and the, uh, there are so many potential factors and potential risks that come with it. Mm -hmm. When you talk about public policy, how can we, what can we as a society learn from this? And what can governments learn mm -hmm. from this study, from what you guys are involved mm -hmm. in, um, to really make it easier yeah. to prevent things? Because that's the most important thing. We can treat, but then we can also prevent. Exactly. Yeah, no, you, you raised some really interesting points there. And the first thing I would say is that perhaps, you know, one of the fields that has made great progress in y utilizing the information about biology to improve treatment outcomes in the first instance, I'll come back to prevention in a moment, is in, in cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, when you present with a tumor, um, one of the first things that you, they will do is um, genotype that tumor to determine whether it's a KRAS mutant or non-mutant. And that information will then determine the treatment regimen that they um, implement for that individual because they know that an antibody-based treatment will not be effective. So already you save that individual from going through a treatment process that wasn't necessary and that was inevitably not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, now we're not there with in mental health at the moment. Um, as Mr. Ludmer mentioned, some of the treatments that we're using, antidepressants, have been developed many decades ago. And still to this day, we're using basically them in a try, try each one in, in succession, depending on whether or not you get a, a treatment response. And the question is whether or not we can um, use this information in terms of DNA methylation, in terms of the, geno the genome, to advance personalized medicine, so preci precision medicine, where you take someone's individual biology um, and you use that to determine what kind of treatments that they, that they would require. Mm -hmm. Now obviously um, that is c coming at it from the, the treatment perspective, but also if we can identify, say for example, my interest in maternal prenatal anxiety and depression, if we can identify a biomarker, if we can identify a molecular signature in a neonatal blood sample or in a buccal sample that we collect routinely um, from our kids, and we can identify that that's an individual that's at risk for a mental health outcome later in life, can we then intervene and help us target appropriate interventions? So you save that individual from going down a developmental trajectory that would lead to an adverse mental health outcome. Because speaking of, and when we're talking about any illness whatsoever, you have an x-ray, you have an MRI, you have something to, uh, give, uh, to give a little indication of what effectively is happening. Mm -hmm. With mental illness, there's so much of it is subjective. Yeah. And so much of it is basically what the patient or the client will then say to mm -hmm. the physician. And, and so much is then determined, and that would effectively determine what course of prescription, what co course of medication mm -hmm. that person would effectively receive. But now, when we're talking about science, we can actually look at it like an x-ray. Am mm -hmm. I wrong? That is, that's the hope. Um, you know, when we look, at, when we look in, the, in, in the cancer field, for example, mm -hmm. you can take a biopsy of that tumor, and you can sequence it. And you can see, you know, where are the errors? Where are the errors in that in, in that code compared to a normal piece of tissue mm -hmm. sampled from the same individual? So you can compare and contrast from that same individual. In mental health, it's not that easy. Where is the tumor? Where is the lesion? Where can you take the tissue to compare to the normal tissue from within an individual? Mm -hmm. And we can't do that. But what we can do is compare them to individuals that don't demonstrate that phenotype. And that's where we need these, these large cohorts where we have individuals that either are high risk or low risk. And then we try and stati statistically compare um, these individuals in terms of the, 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 um, their biology, but also their psychology. And as you mentioned there, very key point, a lot of it is subjective, it's self-report. And the um, current categorization that we use in mental health, DSM or ICD, um, it doesn't really tell us anything about the underlying biology. So the diagnosis that you get tells you symptoms, and that can be very helpful for you know, figuring out what code to build the insurance, um, but <laughs> not so helpful for understanding what's going on underneath that person's skin. So can we develop a biological indicator that tells us a little bit more than just how someone's feeling on any given day? And what's the hope? I, I, can you potentially do this with an unborn child? Well, that would be that would be very that would be remarkable to be able to do that. So, to give you an idea of the work that's actually already going on um, in that in that context, one of the criticisms that I always face whenever I talk about prenatal stress and um, effects on the child is that just like the nature nurture debate, 
you get people that say, oh, it's all postnatal, you know, the postnatal period, it's all about the postnatal period. So that's why it's important to do studies like we've done in Singapore in the Gusto cohort, um, where they've sampled um, umbilical cord at birth. And what they've found is variation in DNA methylation in children that um, arose as a function both of the child's genotype, but also of maternal mood. So maternal prenatal anxiety, maternal prenatal depression. And that discounts the confounding influence of the postnatal environment because that umbilical cord is sampled right there in the delivery suite. And we also know from that same study that um, we were able to take MRIs at birth. So within the first two weeks of birth, um, those neonates went into an MRI and were able to um, establish that kids that were exposed to high levels of maternal prenatal anxiety but carried a certain copy of a gene called COMT showed changes in the thickness of the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. So an area that's, um, that's quite relevant to COMT because it's one of, the, one of the principal regulators of dopamine within that area. And this is again getting us towards this idea of inter-individual differences in susceptibility through the early environment. Certain kids had a, um, a certain copy of that gene, other kids had a different copy of the gene, and one group was affected in terms of the effects of maternal prenatal anxiety, and another weren't. But the question is, how can we then use that information to predict um, outcomes for those children? And we should know as these kids grow up, so the kids are now five years of age. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a long study, but hopefully the results will be worth the wait. How, this is a tough, perhaps a tough question to answer, but have we, you know, as uh, doctors and, and researchers, when it comes to mental illness, have we been approaching this all wrong, perhaps? I mean, because now that we were, we're getting into the field of epigenetics and the uh, alteration of the genetic makeup or, or the DNA, at least how it appears. Mm -hmm. um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, have we, uh, you know, this is the aha moment, mm -hmm. perhaps, but have we approached it wrong? Well, I wouldn't want to criticize the entire medical field. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think there, um, in one field that made significant advances was that of cardiovascular disease. And really one of the transformative um, studies in that was the Framingham Heart Study. Mm -hmm. um, and that was essentially a, um, a, an initiative that really tried to characterize all of the different uh, risk factors before, in fact, it was one of the studies that um, coined the phrase risk factor um, for cardiovascular disease. And through um, these big epidemiological studies, these longitudinal studies, they were able to identify important risk factors, including blood pressure and cholesterol levels for the risk of different um, cardiac events and different aspects of cardio uh, metabolic disorders. And now, in, when you go into your internist, you can enter in your age, you can enter in your smoking status, your cholesterol levels, your blood pressure, and they can predict the likelihood of, your, of a coronary event over a five or 10 or 15 year period. Mm -hmm. Now we can't do that in mental health yet, but I think that's, that's where we're, we want to be able to, to, to kind of identify both the biological, the psychological and the psychosocial factors that can then be entered into a prediction algorithm to really identify those that are gr at greatest risk. One thing that comes to mind when you're talking about how certain people may be predisposed and, and, and the emotional trauma, for example, is that there could be almost a, a blame in some respects mm. towards the mother yeah. or towards the experience, is that? Yeah. And which can then in turn create more stress. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's something I'm, I'm very conscious of and, and sensitive to because essentially I'm talking to, to mothers and I'm saying, don't get stressed about being stressed, yeah. you know? <laughs> and, it, it, it's, it's a paradox, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think one of the important things is, is breaking down the stigma. Mm -hmm. you know? um, again, going back to my, my own interest in perinatal mental illness, up to one in five women will experience, perinatal mental, Ill will experience mental illness in the perinatal period. Um, and a recent study in the UK has shown that out of 100 cases of perinatal depression, only 10 will actually receive adequate treatment. Now, the question is, what are the barriers to that adequate treatment? When we look at mental illness as a whole, usually only appro approximately one out of three individuals will be adequately treated. So why in the perinatal period does that drop down? Is that perhaps the mother feeling 
there's a reservation to actually have that conversation? I think that's I think that's part of it. I think there's there's almost a myth that you know the perinatal period is this joyous period, um, that um, really you're protected um, from from <coughs> from these um, adverse events. And we know actually that um, depression is the most common major complication of um, maternity. Um, and I think it's really about having that conversation about saying that you know a lot of women are affected and it's not just women it's partners as well yeah. you know being able to tell partners that you know this is very common there's a lot that we can do to help there are um, talking therapies that can help and um, there's pharmacological therapies that can be used and um, but it's trying to break down that stigma so people will have that conversation and um, there's a big controversy at the moment in the field about whether or not you should screen for depression prenatally and you might think why why is that a controversy surely it just makes sense that you would of course screen for depression um, but the problem is then do you have the resources to treat those women do we have the education and um, for the individuals that are carrying out the screening so that they don't get misdiagnosed and then we can actually do some harm and um, so it, it's a conversation there's a consensus that's growing um, from the American College of Obst Obstetricians and Gynecologists, also from the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence in the UK, calling for routine screening, but ensuring that there are safeguards in place and that there's um, the systems in place to ensure that women can get the treatment that they require. Well, part of the problem with that, it, with the early screening, and maybe this, is, this would actually help make things better, mm -hmm. but because there's such a stigma if you determine and you say, well, you are predisposed or this because this is, this is who you are or this mm -hmm. is what you will become, that almost defines you, doesn't it? And it makes it even more difficult because if there's not the adequate resources, the adequate treatment, mm -hmm. people now live with this, I didn't think I had a mental illness, but maybe I do. Yeah, so it's that, it's, it's, it's that great question of, you know, do, you know, should you make people aware, aware of their risks? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that knowledge is power and I think that's such a cliche. Um, but, um, you know, women and, and their partners know about the effects of smoking during pregnancy or alcohol during pregnancy, um, but they, we don't often hear about stress during pregnancy or perinatal mental illness. It's a conversation that we don't really have. And I think if um, women are aware of that, if partners are aware of that, as we as a society are more aware of it, um, then we can, we can help to, to effect change. Mm -hmm. um, they're on the, on the bio biological front, there's actually some fascinating work going on from our colleague who's a collaborator on a number of studies, um, Elizabeth Binder in the Max Planck in Munich, looking at changes in gene expression across pregnancy as a predictor of the likelihood of postpartum depression. And what they found is that dynamic changes in, DNA in um, gene expression, so showing changes in gene expression across pregnancy can actually predict the likelihood of postpartum depression. Now what they're trying to do is replicate this and see just of what use it could be clinically for improving our prediction of postpartum depression. Um, one of the main risk factors for postpartum depression is if you've had postpartum depression previously or if you have a family history. 50% of women who um, have postpartum depression will have a family history of depression. But can we use the biology to increase the prediction accuracy? And that's the, that's the challenge. When we're talking about treating depression, mm -hmm. uh, we're just, I would like to think that we're just at the beginning of, of first of all, addressing it mm -hmm. and, and treating it. But are there effective ways, and we're talking about for mothers, for example, uh, postpartum, is there an effective way at this point to address this and to, I don't know, re reverse as possible mm. or, or, or to treat it in such a way that we can, we're in control of it. For sure. There's a lot that we don't understand about depression. That's, that's for sure. Um, for example, um, the large genome-wide association studies have been largely negative for um, depression. So trying to understand the genetic architecture of, of, of major depression has proved very challenging. Um, but in terms of the treatment of um, postpartum depression, there have been um, effective um, clinical trials of um, cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, or interpersonal therapy. And um, depending on the severity of the, um, of the illness, um, pharmacotherapy is not contraindicated. So um, you can prescribe antidepressants. There's some association um, with paroxetine and congenital 
birth defects if, if exposed in the early pregnancy, in the first trimester, but there are antidepressants that can be used in conjunction with talking therapies to improve um, postpartum illness. Let me ask you, go back to the study of when it comes to the rats for a moment. Um, you know, it just goes to show how, I mean, it's under, you cannot uh, overstate how vital mothers are towards their mm. children and for their children. But when it comes to the father, what role does the mm. father, and, and this, when, when we talk about families now, yes. and I have two little ones, and I, I take it very, very, very seriously, yeah. um, but nothing will ever take away or replace the mother, of course. But what can fathers do? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about you know, taking this further on a human level, for example. How mm. important is that? Well, not to not to overemphasize the role of mothers, but I think one of the um, one of the one of the optimistic and positive things that I'd like to point out with regard to the prenatal stress field is that there's at least two studies that have shown that positive parenting practices and um, a construct called infant attachment, which is the child's perception of the early care environment, can actually buffer the effects, some of the effects of adversity experienced earlier in life. So whether that be with regard to stress hormone exposure in utero mm -hmm. or that um, be with regard to institutionalization, um, they've found that the, the parenting practices in the postnatal period can buffer um, or ameliorate some of the effects of prenatal stress. In terms of fathers, they, can, they play a critical role. Um, my colleague Paul Ranchandani has shown the um, prediction of postnatal depression in fathers um, on child developmental outcomes. Um, so I think it's, it's a, um, an important consideration. One of the problems that we have is that it's very difficult to get fathers to take part in our studies. Um, it's, that sounds, I know that sounds trivial and pedestrian, but actually it, it's quite tricky to keep them engaged. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's, it's a, of course a, a hugely important um, aspect of the child's development. Um, and one of the strongest predictors in a study that came from the lab that I completed my PhD in, where they looked at maternal prenatal stress in utero cortisol, so this um, uh, also referred to as a stress hormone, obviously it carries out many other biological functions, and child development, they found a significant prediction um, from in utero cortisol exposure and baby IQ at 18 months. Um, but one of the strongest predictors in terms of the prenatal stress prediction was the relationship with the partner. And um, so even in the prenatal period, that relationship with the partner, the, the, the trying to um, you know, improve the relationship between the mother and the father is, is cr key for that child's and development. And the baby would feel that effectively. Well, it, in, within, within this study, it was an important predictor um, for the child's development. Um, you know, and I, we, we do know that pregnancy is a heightened time of relationship strain. Um, sadly, re pregnancy is, is actually um, a period where rates of domestic violence actually increase. Um, so we, you know, we have to be mindful that this is, a, this is a tricky time for both mothers and fathers and we have to be able to give them the, the support that they need to ensure the best for, for both mother and father but also for their child. And on that note, it would refer to when it comes to public policy, mm -hmm. when it comes to the hours worked, when it comes to you know, maternity leave and paternity leave. And I mean, yeah. this gets into so many different issues that of course uh, we could spend all night talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's you know that's that's a really controversial subject. The the whole idea of about work stress, sure. matern, mat, um, maternal employment, and how that could influence child outcomes. That's one of the areas that there is not a lot of um, data on at the moment. Um, so we we still don't know. But I think a lot of it will come down to um, how um, stressed or. Um, how much that, that, that woman is actually enjoying her work. Is she flourishing? Is right. it something that she, she enjoys doing versus something that she has to do to support the family? And uh, I think that's, that's an important distinction to make. I mean, there's so many things to talk about, of course, and, and it's one of those things that I'm sure a lot of you have questions as well, but it, it goes to the main point for me that when it comes to, uh, you know, there's so many ways we can look at this, but when we talk about mental illness, when we talk about stress, we talk about children, we all have a responsibility, don't For we? Sure. We all, yeah. as a society, as a family, as a father, as, as mothers, uh, we all have a role to play. For sure. And for lobbying our local politician to make right. sure that there's increased funding for perinatal mental illness. But what's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, you slide the plug there. <laughs> but but it, is, it is fascinating when we look at the study of DNA and you think of it as almost determined and, and mm. defined and unchanging. But this leads into the point that perhaps... 
it gives us some power, mm -hmm. doesn't it? It gives us um, some control over how we're going to approach, mm -hmm. you know, effectively how DNA will then act. Yeah. You know, I, th I think there was a cover of Time magazine where they um, said, epigenetics, your DNA is not your destiny. Um, and 100%. I think you're, you're right, it's, it's a very optimistic time. I do urge caution though, because um, as optimistic and as exciting as it is, it's still a new science. It's still a relatively new science in terms of the environmental influences and regulation of, of, of epigenetic processes. So, you know, we do have to carry out the requisite studies to, you know, really demonstrate how, how much of the epigenome can be changed mm -hmm. and how important that those changes are for mental illness. And I think that they're the questions that we're going to address in the work from the Ludmer Center. Well, we could talk all night. Um, uh, is it possible to open it up to questions if, if, if people would like to ask a question of uh, Dr. O'Donnell? Yeah, uh, well, let's start over there. Yeah. So um, a lot of the a lot of the theory at the moment um, with regard to early interventions in the postnatal period focus on this idea of attachment theory. And um, so this is the it, it's essentially focusing on um, sensitive nurturing parenting. Um, and in that study that I mentioned um, with regard to the um, moderation of in utero cortisol exposure on um, the Bailey scales of infant development, of um, cognitive development of 18 months. It was um, the child's perception of its early care environment, which is in part linked to the levels of sensitive parenting. Um, so a lot of the interventions that occur in the postnatal period um, are with regard to mother-infant interaction, um, so improving, um, improving parenting from that, in that regard. Um, that's, um, that's an interesting idea. The question is, um, is the absence of uh, sensitive parenting re um, related to the concept of, of poor fit, um, which is not a, a concept that I'm actually very familiar with myself, I'll have to admit to. Um, but you touch on an interesting point, which it is related to that. And uh, it's a concept called mismatch in the developmental origins of health and disease, um, which is that the, the field that we're kind of working in this developmental area. And it's this idea that if you have exposure to, um, say, high nutrition or high fat diet or um, undernutrition in pregnancy, mm -hmm. and then you have um, a mismatch with the nutrition level in the, in the postnatal period, is that what's predictive for um, adverse outcomes later on? Um, there, 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 there is controversy about that concept, um, especially for me um, with regard to maternal prenatal anxiety and depression. There is at least one researcher that has um, suggested that it's beneficial um, for neonates and infants to be exposed to prenatal depression and postnatal depression. Um, however, for my research and any of the studies that I've done, actually the children that are exposed to the continuity of depression in the pre and the postnatal period are actually the kids that have the worst developmental outcomes. That's risky, isn't it? I mean, to, yeah. to advocate that, that would be... That's rolling the dice. It was it was one particular study and one particular outcome. Um, so you know the, the the question is whether or not there's a, um, an adaptive value to some of these exposures early in life. Um, there's some suggestion that exposure to prenatal stress may accelerate motor development, um, but maybe that could be at the cost of um, cognitive development, for wow. example. So the. It's, it, you can look at it from um, kind of a damage perspective, like a teratogen, um, where it's having an adverse effect on the development of that infant. Um, or you can look at it as a, as a potentially adaptive ev evolutionary response. Um, and the, the, it, that's still a, a question that's under study in terms of the adaptive value of these changes that we see earlier in life. For example, one of the phenotypes that we see most commonly is um, inattention and hyperactivity um, associated with maternal prenatal anxiety. And my mentor during my PhD argued that perhaps in our evolutionary history, it would be quite adaptive if you lived in a high stress environment to be having quick shifting attention. Um, however, in our current society where we have to sit down and we have to 
read history and read literature, that perhaps having quickly shifting attention could be to the detriment of an individual's um, uh, development. Interesting. Yeah, are there any other questions? There's a, there are two microphones. Um, if it's possible. So I work in public policy, and I want to seek mm -hmm. your advice on, on the implications of this research to public policy. So we, I work at Children's Mental Health Ontario, which is a policy shop regarding, obviously, children's mental health. Um, and we work around ensuring that there's the right services on the ground for kids. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and as you know, and you mentioned in, in what you were talking about, that it's very difficult to access treatment services for kids now. In yeah. fact, kids with severe mental illnesses wait over a year in Ontario now for therapy. Um, and that we know that works. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to make the public policy argument for early intervention, it is hard. Mm -hmm. And so I want to I wanna get your advice as to how, how we make that argument in sort of this environment of scarce dollars and, and understanding the pros and cons to the different pieces. Thank yeah. you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, so when, when I've given my presentations about this intervention um, cohort that I mentioned about the Nurse Family Partnership, I have had several people come up to me at the end of the um, presentation and they said, well, it's great, you know, you, you've seen an association between the intervention and DNA methylation, but that costs a lot of money and you know the intervention works, so why do this study? You know, why are you doing this biological analysis if you know that the intervention works? But what we're really trying to um, identify is that we know that the intervention doesn't work for everyone. There's a lot of inter-individual differences in the response to an intervention. So can we use the biology to identify those that are treatment resistant and then would need a top up? This intervention, for example, um, finishes at two years of age. If we could identify a biological marker that could identify a child that wasn't responding to the intervention, can we then add on a secondary intervention to ensure that there's a positive outcome for that child? And I think with that greater understanding of the biology, then we may be able to advocate more strongly for specific interventions that we know are working. There are many infants that are born with serious medical conditions that make it hard for parents to bond well with them in their early infancy. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that those children are at higher risk of developing problems mm -hmm. in their later lives because of the lack of licking? <laughs> <laughs> Can we just clarify that I'm not advocating licking at a human population <laughs> at all? <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's a good point. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that in the, in the context of um, children with, with medical disorders. What we do know is that we've carried out a study looking at women with medical disorders. So hyperemesis hyper gravidarum, this is an extreme morning sickness throughout pregnancy. Um, Preeclampsia, gestational diabetes. And what we find is that those women that do have medical disorders or pregnancy, their anxiety levels are markedly higher. And the question is whether or not that can have an effect on, 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 on the child's development. And that's a study that's ongoing at the moment. Um, in terms of whether or not um, a medical illness can, can influence the bonding process, I, I, I don't know is, is, the answer, is that the answer to that. It's an interesting, interesting idea. Um, but again, I, I want to go back to what I say, that we know that not all children are affected by early adversity, and those that are affected can be affected in different ways. I don't want to be alarmist um, and just say because someone has had been exposed to one particular type of adversity earlier in life that they're, it's inevitable they're going to go on to develop a, a mental health problem. Oh, actually, just let me just get one more question over here. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they like pop, right? 
Um, so, so some of my colleagues would go so far as to say that the nature-nurture debate is dead. Um, now, I don't, don't know if I would put it in exactly those words. Um, <laughs> But, <laughs> well, well, I, I, get, it, 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 I guess it depends on the phenotype that you're looking at, the outcome that you're looking at. And for the kind of outcomes that we're looking at, like complex phenotypes like mental health, I think what we're beginning to realize is that really it is the interplay of the genome and the environment that's going to be critical for our understanding. We know the heritability of um, major depression is somewhere in the region of 40%, 40 to 50%. Um, and we know that um, there is a, a marked environmental contri contribution. But the question is, can we combine the t those two different types of data to better predict it and better model it? Um, so I don't think I'm coming down on the side of nature or nurture. I think I'm sitting right on the fence. Um, <laughs> Questions so far? You're both very skilled at presenting a complex topic in a, an informal and effective way, so thank, thank you for that. My question has to do with intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. um, my voice is cracking a little bit, but so if a, if a parent experiences trauma and that affects the, the gamete, the sperm, or the egg, can that affect epigenetics? And what kind of implication does that have on your research in the in utero environment um, mm -hmm. when parents might experience trauma before that period takes place? So you've, you've probably highlighted one of the most controversial areas in epigenetics at the moment. It's this notion of um, transgenerational or intergenerational epigenetic inheritance, that you can have an environmental exposure and that can somehow alter the um, epigenome of your germ cells that go on to form the next generation and the, that could potentially be passed on to a, another generation independent of an exposure in the first generation. So crossing from first generation to second generation. Now there's good evidence of that in plants. Um, the evidence in humans is lacking. Um, there, it's, it's, it's still a very controversial area that the, the requisite studies to identify causality have not been conducted. It's something that we need to do. Um, but it, the, the principle um, exists, um, at least in terms of the behavioral transmission. Um, so we know that mate um, quality choice in animals, and we know that nutrition uh, deprivation in, in rodent models can have effects across generations. Um, but the, the controversial um, topic is this transmission of a state. So transmission of, for example, the levels of DNA methylation at one particular um, site, almost like you would a mutation across the generations. And that hasn't been demonstrated in humans convincingly. Um, so it's still, it's still a, a topic that's, that's up for discussion. Um, but in principle, yes, this idea that there can be behavioral transmission across generations has been shown um, in a number of studies. And I believe, uh, thank you very much. I believe we have time for one more question. Oh, hey, is there, nope. Sorry, I just assumed you were going to the microphone. Yes, I saw one, one more over there, yes. Hi, good evening. Um, so similarly to skipping a generation and so on, I'm kind of wondering about having more than one child and uh, whether your research is looking at that at all. Mm. So say the mother was doing well with the first child but now experiences anxiety, child number two, but then mm -hmm. is okay with child number three. Does anything get carried over um, if we're only looking at nature versus nurture? Yeah, that, that is a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so uh, in the cohort that I mentioned where we had the 15,000 pregnancies in the UK, um, we didn't have siblings. It was essentially firstborns. There's a couple of twins in there. Um, but in the Maven study, we do have a sibling design. Um, so we're recruiting as many of the siblings as we can um, to follow up. And that's exactly the kind of questions that we're asking. Um, is there, you know, do parenting practices change from child to child? Um, and can we use that sibling design where we know that there's going to be at least some shared genetic variance within the siblings um, to predict child outcomes? Um, sorry, go ahead. And I'm also just curious, because um, I've done some work in Lebanon where I saw impacts of post-war post mm -hmm. um, you know, on family life and parenting and so on, and of course with what's happening in Syria and in other wars around the world. So I'm also kind of curious, how will this then impact what's happening with those future generations of kids. So. Yeah, no, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. Um, you know, that, that exposure to, to extreme trauma, uh, it's, 
it's difficult to say how it will influence the epigenome. We do know that, for example, one of the earliest studies in uh, the field of environmental influences on DNA methylation in human subjects was actually related to the Dutch hunger winter, which was a period of brief famine exposure um, during World War II. And what they found was that those um, mothers who conceived um, during the famine, so periconceptual exposure to famine, was actually associated with changes in DNA methylation of a gene called IGF2, which is important in metabolism, several decades after the exposure. So that provides a proof of principle that exposure to war, the, the question is there from that study, the question that I would like to answer is, was it the nutritional deprivation? Was it the stress that the woman was experiencing because of the nutritional deprivation? Was it the synergy of the two? Um, it's difficult to disentangle, but obviously that was associated with, with, with war exposure. Um, there's, also, um, yeah, the, there's, al there's also been studies looking at war exposed children in Israel in the 60s. Um, looking at long-term effects on emotional and behavioral difficulties. And they used an interesting design where they, their control group was um, recruited two years after the Six Day War. Um, and they found that the war exposed ch children, um, particularly if they were um, infants within six months, uh, had increased behavioral problems as they grow up. So I think there's, there is evidence out there to suggest that war exposure will, can, potentially lead to um, variation in emotional and behavioural difficulties. <laughs> Great. Don't worry. I've only got this as notes to myself. When they told me that uh, I'd speak for three minutes, I said, well, you know, I, I can show 15 slides in three minutes. <laughs> I uh, think, first of all, uh, my name is Alan Evans. Um, I'm one of the co-directors of the Ludma Center, one of the three musketeers, along with Celia Greenwood and with uh, Michael Meany, who is sadly not with us today. Um, I think, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, uh, Kieran for uh, just a, a wonderful, elegant discussion of a very complex <laughs> topic. The Ludma Center has brought it to, a, to a, new, a new way of approaching brain research where we discuss mechanisms, not just labels, not uh, everybody's got autism. There are subtypes and sub-disorders. We understand the mechanisms and the genes that go with those mechanisms that allow us to understand uh, the, the, um, the, the, the phenotype. My own, my own particular work is involved in understanding brain wiring and abnormal brain wiring in, in developing child and in, in, in adulthood. Um, it's not like looking for a brain tumor or a stroke. There is no focal spot that you can point to. We have to understand how the brain is organized and how it works together. And to, to uh, break that down into uh, its complexities to understand the imaging, the wiring, the gen genes, the epigenes, the behavior, requires big data, large amounts of computational uh, approaches, what we call a multivariate trajectory an analysis, to use the, the buzzword. But none of this can happen without, without the, the resources of the Ludma Center. And uh, the Ludma Center would not exist without Irving and Freeman's support. And uh, I think we all owe them a huge debt of gratitude for what they've done. No, I, I, I say this with, with, without uh, any, any awkwardness. Uh, uh, the Ludma Center has changed my professional life. I've, uh, like Celia, I labored uh, in, in uh, anonymity in some ways uh, at the coalface. Um, the Ludma Center has, has brought that kind of approach to the fore where we understand that this machinery can be applied to any disorder whether it's a developmental disorder, a psychiatric disorder, a neurological disorder, it's the same machinery. And the Ludma Center is an incredibly powerful engine. There's a, there's, a, there's a theme here that we haven't touched on today, and that is that this whole thing is not just a, a, a Montreal affair or a, or, or a Toronto affair. It's First of all, it's a national affair. The Ludma Center is a hub for networks in autism research, Alzheimer's disease research across the country. It's also um, a binding principle for us to interact with, with our colleagues around the world, which Irvin mentioned that I'm going to China tomorrow. It's on behalf of the Ludma Center and the globalization of, of this kind of multivariate brain research. Uh, this, it's incredibly exciting. Um, I'm, I'm uh, 
talking uh, with colleagues in China and Cuba about what we call CCC access. And those three countries have dramatically different cultural demographics, social problems, developmental problems. The Cubans have more experience than most of us do of translating the basic research into the clinic. With no resources whatsoever, they've managed to, to apply brain research to the clinic, into the com community. Chinese have a huge uh, uh, population, and a lot of them are in their rural areas. They have the same kind of problem. They actually have money. And this whole enterprise of a CCC axis, Canada, Cuba, uh, China axis, is just one example of many programs and projects that the Ludma Center is heavily engaged in. This is a very exciting time for all of us. Um, I, could, I could go on, but uh, we're, we're also engaged in what is called the Open Science Project of the MNI, which is taking advantage of the Ludma Center infrastructure to put our data out into the, into the world for free, to allow other scientists get to get at that data, rather than sitting on the data and saying, my data and my, my publication, it's put out into the public domain so many people can get at it. Many people can trade on that data and find new findings. This is amplifying the power of that vision enormously. It, it's a global community that we're building here. So with all of that said, uh, again, Irving, Freema, thank you so much for launching this. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you very much. Well, it falls to me to um, provide just a few uh, closing remarks. I uh, want to reiterate uh, thanks that's been expressed uh, to Dr. O'Donnell. Uh, not only is he a star researcher, a star speaker, a star fill-in, he's also a star of television. And you'll see proof of that if you all get up early tomorrow morning, close your ears now, and tune in to CTV, uh, uh, Canada AM, where our favorite guest, uh, researcher uh, is going to be uh, talking about the same subject as you have this evening? Television Your television debut. Well, we'll be all there cheering you on at 7.30 tomorrow morning. And uh, thank you again for what you've contributed tonight. I, th I predict a great career for you in television. Wouldn't you say, Anthony? I think well, better than I am. No. <laughs> uh, well, now I know what you do, and you do it darn well. And thank you very much indeed. Uh, it takes no mean uh, skill to... Uh, to elicit from these people who have such a vast knowledge to express it in terms that uh, those of us who aren't involved in the field can understand. Well, he makes it easier. Th yeah, this yeah. is a prop, by yeah, the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you've got nothing written on it. I got, I got nothing on 